Hi, I'm Steve Shocker. I'm the principal at St. Norbert School. And I'm Beverly Gray, the assistant principal. I'm Kirk Johnson, the school counselor at St. Norbert. So we're speaking to you from St. Norbert Church, and just so that, we're, that you guys know that we're without masks because we're socially distanced, um, at times it looks like we're right next to each other on your screen, but um, we are socially distanced in front here. Speaking for all our teachers and staff, we are really, really excited to get all of you back at school. We'd like to take some time to speak to our parents and especially our students about the upcoming year. Following many weeks of preparation, we're ready for our teachers and students to return to school. And due to present COVID-19 pan the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we've changed some routines and protocols to make sure we're all safe while we're at St. Norbert School. Today, what we'd like to do is have a conversational question and answer session so that some, and certainly not all, of the most commonly asked questions that we've heard can be discussed and so that we're all ready for our first day of in-person learning. Mr. Johnson is going to share most of the questions, and Mrs. Great and I, along with Mr. Johnson, will provide the responses. We've purposely constructed most of these questions from the perspective of our students. We felt that, most importantly, our children need to understand these new routines and also the changing of some old routines. And before we start again, it's going to be impossible for us to answer every question. We know that. We've posted each of our contact, each of our contact information so that you may reach out to us if you have further questions that you felt you need an answer to. And also, our website will include comprehensive material pertaining to our new school guidelines, a revised St. Norbert school handbook, and other COVID-19 related material. So, Let's get started. All right, thanks, Mr. Shocker. Um, first off, let me, let me start by saying that I am really excited as well to start the school year. Um, and I'm really confident that we'll get through this together as long as we're following the safety guidelines that we um, discuss here today. Um, I think maybe the best place to start would maybe just be by explaining when school is gonna start, uh, Mr. Shocker. Okay, so school is going to start, uh, our K-8 students will start at August 20th, and it's kind of the same time, uh, building opens at 745, uh, classes will begin at 8 o'clock. Our preschool students will begin a little bit later, they're going to start on August 24th. Okay, great. Um, so just around the corner. Um, when I've been reading the safety and health guidelines I've um, given by the Archdiocese, I've seen this word called cohort. I, I was wondering if you could explain what cohort means. Yeah, and I think that's the key principle here to us returning and uh, returning safely and uh, just continuing on is that our under, we all need to understand this cohort model. All archdioceses of Chicago schools are going to operate under this cohort model when our buildings open. <clears throat> under this model, students and staff are grouped by a cohort, or in our case, really most of the time we're talking about a cohort, we're talking about homerooms. These groupings are static. They, as, as much as we can, we want to keep these group, these group, these cohorts, these homerooms together as a one group. These groupings are <clears throat> of the children with uh, a teacher, their homeroom teacher will be part of their cohort, and as much of the day this cohort will stay together. And again, homeroom teachers are considered part of this cohort, the same cohort as their students, but other teachers like Mrs. Contreras, uh, Ms. Cardona, Ms. Gall, Mr. Borst, Mr. Beeler, um, they are not considered a part of the cohort, but you will be working with those teachers also. Um, also, classroom furniture will look a little different. The classrooms are gonna look a little different because we've arranged each classroom to maximize the space between students as they're in these cohorts in the classrooms. Great, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, I think um, it's just good to remember that it's kind of like just, it's just your homeroom um, for students. Um, another piece of the reopening that I think a lot of people probably have questions about are ma about masks. Um, I think that that's been something that's been pretty common in our everyday lives as Americans. Um, so 
when we're coming back to school, do we have to wear masks? Yeah, and what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, a lot of this I'm going to read so I make sure that I follow exactly. I don't want to go off um, script here because the mask is also a very important component of all of us staying safe. So all individuals in our building is, are going to have to wear masks at all times unless they're younger than two years of age. We're asking all families to purchase masks for their children. Um, and there are basically a couple different types of masks. A, re a reusable mask, um, like a, a cloth mask, should be washed ev after every school day. So if you've got a mask like this one, it, this needs to be washed. In my cloth mask, I need to wash that every day. If you're using a disposable mask, these masks should be discarded after every day and a new disposable mask uh, bring the next day. Now we're going to have also certain teachers in our building. Uh, Ms. Cardona and our preschool teachers will hopefully have transparent masks. They are going to look a little different because of the importance of having them articulate words to our preschool kids and also as we teach a world language. Um, we are going to allow the use of gaiters, those pull-up face coverings, as an alternative to masks, provided that they have three layers of fabric and can remain over the mouth and nose at all times. Our masks shouldn't contain messages or images that would distract us from the educational environment of the school. We will, St. Norbert School, will maintain a supply of a minimum of five masks per student in the event a student either forgets their mask, it becomes wet, or, or, or they break their mask. And then masks can only be removed in special circumstances, and um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, okay. Great, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think that's a really important point, um, that we have to be wearing masks. Um, and teachers will be enforcing that, um, just making sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, Mrs. Gray, I, I was wondering if you maybe could explain just maybe some of the general health um, and safety protocols that outside of the masks. Sure. Okay, so Mr. Shocker and I have been working all summer on putting procedures together to keep the students healthy and safe. And these include rerouting how the students are going to walk around the building. So we're going to utilize the outside of the building as much as possible when the students are going from their classroom to say, uh, Grace Hall or the gym for lunch um, and then for entering the building which I'll talk about in a minute and when we leave at the end of the day. Um, spaces have also been designated for outside instruction and the hallways have been taped for social distancing reminders and hand sanitizing stations have been stationed around the building. Great. Um, those, are, those are some great rules I think to keep us safe. Um, and, and just on that topic that you kind of were um, touching on a little bit, maybe, maybe it, um, like, could you walk me through or walk all of us through um, like what the average day is going to look like, maybe starting from drop off th um, through like the morning routine? Okay, so let's yeah, start with uh, morning drop off. So there's one important thing that parents are going to have to remember to do every morning. It's going to be your responsibility to do a temperature check and a wellness check. And the wellness check is asking them some questions as to um, whether they've had a fever or a cough or generally how are they feeling. Um, also, you need to make sure that your child comes to school with their mask uh, because we're not going to allow the children to get on the bus or to get out of their cars if they're not wearing a mask. So what's drop-off going to look like this year? Um, for K to 8, children are going to uh, arrive between 745 and 8 o'clock as always. Cars are going to come in the west entrance of the parking lot and pull up along the, the gym doors as we've been doing for years. Um, unlike past years, we're not really going to be able to help the kids get out of the cars, so uh, we'll open the door, the kids will hopefully pop out on their own, and then the K to 5 students will walk around the building through the, um, will walk down the side of the gym, uh, through the parking lot, and down Elm Street to their classroom doors. Uh, there will be adults along that route to keep them safe and to make sure that they're staying social distance and getting to their destination. 
The eighth graders will go into Grace Hall as they always have and will be temperature checked and hand sanitized as they go in. Um, sixth and seventh grade are going to go in through the Grace Hall lunchroom doors where they will also be um, temperature checked and hand, hand sanitized. Uh, once they enter their rooms, uh, they will go and sit in their desks until teachers give them instructions on how to utilize their lockers and cubbies. For um, preschool, they're going to arrive between 8 and 8.15. Since they need a little bit more assistance getting out of their cars in the morning, um, we didn't want them to interfere with the K-8 to carpool line. So they're going to also come in through the west entrance of the parking lot. They're going to pull up to the Grace Hall doors instead of the gym doors like they did last year. And some preschool teachers will be there to um, take the students from the parents after the parents get the kids out of the cars. They will do a wellness check or a temperature check with the students at that time and then uh, have them escorted into their classrooms. Um, but again, it's very important that the students have their masks on when they exit their cars. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, um, and I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of this information is going to be in our new student handbook, yes. too. So if you know you forget about some of this stuff, like any normal person, right? Like it's going to be there for you to reference. Perfect. Um, so also in that morning routine, I think a lot of students at our school use usually use lockers or cubbies. So maybe could you go into that a little bit too? Or did you touch well, on that? The individual homeroom teachers will instruct the teachers on how their lockers and cubbies are gonna be used. Great, the, so yeah. see I needed that reminder too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, cool, moving on. Um, so I think when we're thinking about the beginning of the day and just the general flow of the day, I think it might be important to touch on how students are gonna be asked to move around the school. Um, so Mr. Shocker, maybe could you go into detail about like how students are gonna be going from teacher to teacher and, and just getting to the teachers that they need to see. Yeah, the, <clears throat> before I get into that, I just wanna stress, <clears throat> one of the big changes, I think, as Mrs. Great said, is this, uh, when we're being dropped off in the morning, um, the K-5 kids, and all of you know this, that in each one of your classrooms, there's a door in back and that door opens up to Elm Street, I believe, in the back, and we're gonna be utilizing those doors like we really haven't before. So when we come in in the morning, you are gonna be dropped off, and then you're gonna walk around, as Mrs. Great said, through the parking lot, but really also through the playground, all the way around, and there will be adult guidance, and we're, this way, we have each cohort, or homeroom, coming in on their own, and we're really trying to, as best we can, minimize traffic congestion. We don't want to have a lot of kids moving around at the same place at the same time. So one way we're going to do that, right, so right when you come into the school, you're going to be coming in those back entrances, um, and that's where your teacher will meet you, as uh, Mrs. Great said, for the um, sanitization and the symptoms questions and stuff. So, okay. When you walk into school, you're going to see, and some of you have been back to Mass, um, if you go to church these days, it looks a little different. It's got markings on the floor, markings on the pews, and kind of similar to that, uh, our school is going to have the floor, the, uh, the floor, the hallways that we walk through are going to be divided in, in kind of a right and a left. And if you think about how your parents drive the car, you just stay to the right. And we're going to need to follow that very closely, and we're going to have dividing uh, tape marks on the floor that will divide right from left so that when you're moving a direction you're always on the right side um, of the hall of the uh, our hallways as best you can because sometimes you're gonna have to go left into a classroom but that's gonna be something different the other thing that you're going to see are markings floor decals that are marked off at six foot intervals so we do want and again very similarly to church if you've been back to church we need to maintain social distancing at all time so we really have to be aware that we're uh, greater than six feet away from each other as we walk through the hall. Um, okay. Cool. Yeah, I think having those visuals like in and around the school are super helpful because like when I think about myself like walking around the school, I need those visuals too. So I think that's really good for our, for our, for our families and all that. Um, perfect. Um, so 
when kids are in, in the classroom and they need to get a drink of water or they need to use the restroom, like how is that policy going to look? And these are going to be a little different too. Um, we each will have water bottles. We'll talk about water bottles in a few minutes, but you, can, you will still be able to fill your water bottles, water bottles in those, uh, at those fountains that have water bottle fillers, but we're not going to be able to use a drinking fountain to drink water. Those will be turned off, and there will be signs and markings uh, that will uh, remind you we, we aren't using the drinking fountain part of our, our, found, our uh, drinking fountain areas, but we, uh, we will be able to use the water bottle fillers. Um, and the bathrooms, we, we will assign each, we're going to assign bathrooms to preschool children will have their own bathroom. Kindergarten through second grade will have their own bathroom. Third grade through fifth grade will have their own bathroom. Sixth grade will have their own bathroom. And seventh and eighth grade will have their own bathrooms. It's very important, again, if you think back on that cohort model, even though we're kind of maybe mixing homerooms here, we're keeping the exposure to a minimum of kids. We're also going to only allow three students can be in a bathroom at a time. And when you're in the bathrooms, they're going to look a little different because some of the, our basins we will not be able to use um, and some of the toilets we will not be able to use also, just again, to keep distanced and to keep um, safe. Um, uh, and as we get into school, your teachers will go into these protocols with a little bit more detail. And, um, but do know that uh, different, different children will have different areas, different bathrooms to use, and the bathrooms when you're in there will also look a little bit differently. But this is, um, I think, well planned and it's for everyone's safety. Great. Yeah, I agree. I think it's just um, good to be on the safe side um, in terms of getting in and around the school. Um, so right now, as I'm thinking about coming back to school myself, um, I'm also thinking a lot about students and how they're going to be um, interacting with other kids. And I think it's important to maybe talk about like if where kids can sit and and the distancing that we need to allow. So maybe could you go into that a little bit too? Yeah, the, the, again, when you walk into your classroom, you're gonna see your classroom and what we've called it, we've called it decluttering. So we've taken things out of classrooms to give our, ourselves maximum amount, a lot of space in your classroom. They're really gonna look kind of uh, different and open. But this is because we need to maintain three to six feet between children, uh, between students and their classrooms. And um, so that we're going, and we're need, we'll need to really be, we really need to be careful about that, even in our own cohorts, to maintain that three to six foot um, social distancing at all times. Great, yeah, I think that's important. Um, and I th we may go into this later, but I think it's important to also note that we're gonna have plexiglass really around the school in front of a lot of desks and stuff. So if students have questions, you know, there will be a barrier between um, teachers and staff and then students. Um, okay. So obviously a lot of, a lot of our lives, um, we're wearing masks these days um, when we're interacting with people. Are we ever really allowed to take masks off at school? Okay. There, there will be times, and ask, actually we might even call these mask breaks that we're going to have. If we're outside and we maintain social distancing, that six foot social distancing, distancing, we will be allowed to take off masks. Now this is gonna happen um, in recess, uh, in your PE classes, which will be outside, and also each one of the classrooms will have their own space, sort of an outside area that your homeroom teacher or in the middle school, your, maybe your English teacher, your math teacher might just take you out for either a read aloud or to do a quick math lesson, but we can do those outside. We're asking, and I will be sending out information um, about this also in some, um, maybe my next parent letter, will be that we ask each child to come to school with a beach towel. And we think with beach towels, we'll be able to use the outdoor space, sit on a beach towel, which will almost force us to be socially distanced when we're outside. We're asking all our teachers to really be aware of making sure that there are times in the day that we can get outside and take our masks off. And this year, we might even just take a break to take a walk around the block just to give ourselves an opportunity to take our masks off to, uh, to get into some air. Um, and, but 
we will be doing that throughout the year, and those will be opportunities to take your masks off. But other than those, we really have to keep our masks on at all other times. Okay, great. And I love the idea of beach towels. I think it <laughs> makes me think I'm at the beach. So that's, I'm always on board with that. All right, great. Um, so as I'm thinking, I think as we're all thinking about the cohort and the, um, and the homeroom model, I think it's also too, uh, important maybe ask some questions around how students are gonna participate in um, like with special teachers. So Mrs. Great, could you maybe go into how students are gonna participate in music and art and PE and, and things like that? Okay, so using the cohort model, the uh, K-8 to art, music, tech, and Spanish teachers are gonna go into the grade level classrooms and remain socially distant from the rest of the class to conduct their lessons. Um, if needed, they will bring individual materials to be distributed to classes. So if Mrs. Contreras has an art project that uh, the kids need colored paper for, she will bring sheets of paper for each child uh, so that no one has to share uh, if there's other utensils that they need. Uh, for Mr. Beeler and PE classes, he's going to drop off and pick up the kids using the classroom fire doors and then probably do something in the playground area or walk over to Village Hall and do an exercise out there. Um, the first 12 weeks of school, especially the students are not going to need to change into their gym uniforms so that um, they can get as much outdoor time as possible. This process is gonna vary a little bit for the six to eight students. Um, their elective and PE period is going to remain like at the same time it has been. Um, they will be going to the special areas, classrooms, except for maybe one or two classes where the teacher will come to, to the students. And we will make sure that the co or the, those rooms get cleaned every time a cohort changes there. Um, PE classes will also be held outside as much as possible. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna we're just gonna do the best that we can, right? The cohort is, um, it just seems like the best thing to do. So I, I'm glad that you cleared that up. Um, and then when we're in this model, um, like will students need to eat their lunches like in their classrooms or what's lunch gonna look like? Okay, well, Mr. Shocker and I didn't feel that it was good for the students to be able to, to have to eat in their classrooms after spending all day in their classrooms with instruction. So we have set up the Grace Hall and the gym with uh, enough tables to have three students to a table, socially distanced, so they will either eat in the gym or in Grace Hall depending on their classroom assignment. And um, it's been uh, assigned so that Tables can be sanitized between uses. Uh, lunch times have been modified slightly to give the cleaning staff time to get in there to, um, to do that cleaning. And um, okay, so that covers lunch. For recess, the playground is gonna be broken down into three different sections. Um, technically, the cohort shouldn't be intermingling lunch when they're out in the, on the playground. And so we'll have a section where maybe they're playing four squares, a section where they're on the um, Kyle's Treehouse Playground equipment, and another section where maybe they're playing basketball. Uh, and then that will rotate from day to day so that each class gets an opportunity to use the different sections of the playground. And then we will get the playground equipment clean between cohort uses um, as necessary. And hopefully this way each group will be able to access, you know, the playground if that's where their favorite spot is once or twice a week. Got it. Yeah, it's, um, we're just trying to, yeah, we're going to do a rotation. So that sounds good with the recess. Um, okay. Um, and then in terms of, so we talked about drop off. In terms of pickup, what is that going to look like? Is that the same as last year? Is that a little different? No, that's going to be a little different this year too um, okay. in that, we don't want the parents congregating, but we realize that with the preschoolers, 
the kids need a little bit more help than the older kids. So we're going to have preschool pickup at um, 2.30. Their homeroom teachers will lead the kids out. The parents will pull into the first two lines of the carpool and they will be able to go and get their student from, the, from their teacher and then walk their kids back to the car. And then when everybody is in the car, those two lines will be able to leave the parking lot. The K through eight students will be dismissed at 245 and they will either come around the outside of the building led with their teachers or there are paths through the building where there's only one cohort in the hallway at a time uh, where they will be dismissed through either the canopy door, a gym door, or one of the Grace Hall doors. Uh, parents are asked to stay at their cars. Maybe you've got a flag that you wave or you stand on your bumper or your, your, your door and wave to them so they can see you and teachers will help the younger kids especially find you. Yeah, great. I think at the end of the day, things are a little chaotic. So yeah, having that sign, whatever that is for you, I think that that's important just to kind of um, bridge the communication gap. Great. Um, okay, so on the, on the flip side, let's say that I'm a student at St. Norbert. I'm looking to take the bus every day. What is that going to look like, well, Mr. Shocker? Okay, we, we will have this pretty much the same bus pickup and drop-off procedures that we had um, last year. Uh, the bus will be arriving, our, our bus that's coming from the Holy Cross campus will be arriving there, you know, starting time. And we all know that the, at the beginning of the year, it's a little, um, we need to be a little flexible, but we're asking for the buses to leave Holy Cross campus right around 7.20 in the morning. And of course, before students get on that bus, they have to go through their symptom checks with their parents. Um, they also will be, it'll be necessary for them to be with masks on the bus at all times. We're also going to start the year with assigned seating on the bus. We can easily socially distance ourselves while sitting on the bus, but we will be giving assigned seating, and I think this will be helpful to the bus driver, and it'll also be helpful uh, to us at St. Norbert School to maintain the social distancing, to know that the social distancing is maintained on the bus. Okay. Um, great, yeah, it's good to just have a general idea of what the, the rules are gonna be on the bus. Um, I think in the spirit, or in the, since we're talking about like kind of after school services and stuff, um, I was kind of, from a parent's perspective, I'm thinking about, about before and after school care. Is that really gonna exist this year? What is that gonna look like? It is, we, uh, Mrs. Philbin, um, who uh, is there, uh, supervisor of our after and before school care, met with uh, Mrs. Great and myself. Um, we've talked a few times this summer and we think we've got a pretty good um, uh, system in place. Uh, we're gonna have to have a little bit more adult supervision and we're gonna have to use a few more rooms, but we feel that we're going to allow students to safely participate in both before and after school care offerings um, and the, the rooms that we're going to use, the number of supervisors we're going to need are strictly dependent upon how many children are going to use the after school and before scare program, but we will have the, that available uh, for parents. Okay, so that's encouraging to hear. Good. Um, and then, so Mr. Shocker, um, in addition to those um, like after school programs, um, I'm thinking also about like athletics and things like band and orchestra, um, and after, just in general after school activities. Um, so can you maybe go into detail about what that's gonna look like too? Sure, the, the, our interscholastic athletic program, um, at this, the, as we're taping this, we have not had final word, but there, as I had mentioned in my last parent letter, we're pretty sure that they're not gonna be allowing us to participate with our football program and our girls volleyball program following the advice of the IH IHSA recommendations. Um, but we are kind of waiting for final word on that. I do feel like I would be very surprised if those two programs will be starting. I believe what we're gonna be doing is, um, as the high school has done, uh, delaying those programs with the football and girls volleyball until the spring. 
Um, it also, um, the situation we're in right now with the COVID-19 pandemic does affect what we're offering for after school activities. Again, referring back to the cohort model, um, the, the, the ability to offer an activity that, does, that is, can be done socially distanced and safely, um, it's, it, we're gonna have to be a little creative here um, and another thing that I had mentioned in our, um, in my parent letter was our athletic committee met just this week and feeling that we'd like to offer children, our students some type of after school activities, we are presently kind of brainstorming and seeing what we can come up with. So I think more details will come of that, but it definitely will look different and it's gonna look different because of the, the, our ability to not um, mix cohorts and also to uh, continue social distancing. The band program also, because we can't have at this moment in time wind instruments or brass instruments um, um, played in a group, um, we're going to have to work out um, how that's all gonna look. And I would, again, ask that we be a little patient for this. We've gotta see, uh, we do have some new uh, children in the building, so we have to see how many kids are interested in, in, a, in a band uh, type of activity and then we have to also see can we facilitate this safely so more information will come on that but as I, I say I'm optimistic that we're going to be able to figure out some activities for kids to take part in an, in an after school program great yeah I'm, I'm pretty optimistic as well since we work together on that um, with the athletic committee and I think to piggyback off of that um, I do know that we're working on getting a, a parent survey out just to kind of gauge what um, families are looking for in terms of um, potential or just what they're interested in for um, their kids in terms of um, extracurricular activities. So great. Um, another, another key question that I think a lot of parents have is around water bottles. Um, last year, I think we had the kids could bring whatever water bottles they had, right? Like, what is that gonna look like this year? Well, for the water bottles, we can bring refillable water bottles from home. We need the water bottles to be kept closed when they're not being used. So when you're not drinking, it needs to be closed. You, we will be able to take short sips of water by moving our masks to the side and take a sip of water. And we're talking about, you know, less than 10 seconds kind of a sip. We don't need to remove the mask entirely or separate by six feet while you're doing this. But, um, but be, you need to be careful. And, and also, if the mask becomes wet, we have to replace that. Uh, a, a, a mask that's wet is not doing what we need the mask to do uh, safe, to, uh, to work safely for us, so we need to replace that mask. But we will definitely have water bottles here, keep them closed, bring them to great, school. Yeah. Great, yeah, I think um, just like we've been talking about before, um, sometimes we're gonna make mistakes with you know, following some of these rules, but we're gonna have people instructing us how to do these things. So if you make a mistake here and there, it's okay, but let's try our best to, um, to, take, to drink water the proper way. Um, okay, so um, when I think about like the classrooms and students working together, um, and they can't, since we can't really, students can't really sit together, what are group projects gonna look like? This was a very important piece of um, conver very important part of conversations that Mrs. Great and I had um, about how much we do want to somehow figure out a way, we wanted to somehow figure out a way to continue the ability for teachers to do group projects. How could you do a group project if everybody's got to be six feet away from each other? So due to our being a small school and our really uh, really a functional facility, our school building, what we figured out is the way that our lunchroom and our gymnasium will be set up for serving lunch, we can also use those at different times of the day for small groups or cohorts to use for group projects. So we will be able to, we feel, allow teachers to kind of sign up for different times that they can then use these spaces for group projects and use them safely, keeping kids socially distanced without sharing materials. But we do feel it is really important that we've figured out a way to try to keep the teachers, um, to, to give the teachers the avail availability um, and access to a group area. 
Yeah, I think, um, I think if any school is prepared to really shift um, to a really functional like group project model, I think we're able to do it because we have smaller class sizes. So I think um, that's encouraging to hear. Um, so I think one, one question that I think is a lot on, on, on a lot of people's minds is about um, people that are getting sick or people in the community getting sick. So what's, what's kind of the protocol or what's the, what happens if one of our community members gets sick? Okay, and I would say of all the questions that we've received, this, many of them revolve around this particular area. And what I'm doing here is I'm going to share with you, um, and this information will be on our website, but I do think it's important that I share to you um, these infection protocols and also um, to know that I, I'm going to pretty much read most of these verbatim because I don't want to go ad lib any of this stuff and make any mistakes on this. So temperature checks of all students and staff has to be taken upon arrival each morning. All of us will have our temperatures checked every morning. Every student that enters our building will have their temperature checked every morning. Um, what we're looking at is anyone that has a temperature above 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit must be sent home and encouraged, will encourage them, uh, employees or families, to contact a doctor. The symptoms that we're looking at following CDC um, protocol are, and there are many of them, and this list does not include all possible symptoms. Fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headache, new, uh, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion, runny nose, and it does go on. Uh, uh, there are uh, a few others that we're seeing common symptoms, but um, we are going to be very cautious about this, and if we do feel that a, that a child is exhibiting any of these symptoms, we are going to um, follow, get into our infection protocol. If a student is exhibiting fever or two or more of the aforementioned symptoms, uh, COVID-19 symptoms, they will be immediately separated from others. We have a separate nurse's station set up in the front of the, in front of our building, kind of where near where Mrs. Hiddle's desk is, where um, and we will that we will bring these children uh, as we s separate them from their cohort. Parents will be contacted immediately, and the student will need to be taken home. We will utilize other emergency contacts if we can't um, immediately get a hold of parents. We ask that the student should see a doctor to assess symptoms and or, and or administer COVID-19 test. Parents should be encouraged to read the CDC guidelines for caring for oneself and others. For students that see a doctor and it is determined the illness is not COVID-19, either through a test or through a doctor's diagnosis, the student may return to school when symptoms subside with a doctor's note confirming negative COVID-19 diagnosis. If the student has symptoms, but has tested negative on a COVID-19 test, they should remain at home until symptoms disappear. They must provide a doctor's note or the documented COVID-19 test results before being allowed to return to school. If the student tests positive for COVID-19 or does not seek medical attention, students must isolate and not return to school until they have met CDC's criteria to discontinue home isolation, which currently includes three days with no fever and other symptoms, improvement by 75%, and 10 to 14 days since symptoms first appeared. I use 10 to 14 because when all of our material was put together, it was 14 days. We're now understanding that it has been changed to, to 10 days. Students will be allowed to complete and submit work if they need to be in isolation remotely during the time they're away from school. And if a student is positively di diagnosed for COVID-19, they'll need to follow the isolation protocol. Uh, and also, just let me add, situations involving employees or volunteers, I'm not going to get into that here. That's going to be in our material that will be posted on the website. Now, the isolation protocol is if any student is diagnosed with COVID-19, I will immediately contact my regional director for more instruction. While every situation really is going to be unique, the following steps pretty much are going to have to be implemented. The student will be sent home and monitored for ongoing symptoms as I just described. 
I will need to distribute a COVID-19 exposure letter to all parents and our employees. But it is essential that the privacy of the impacted student or staff member be protected. I, I, I am not going to disclose the specific identity of the infected individual to parents or any employees who do not need to know. And we, we need to be very clear. For example, it would be appropriate, appropriate for me to inform the homeroom teacher if a student in the teacher's class has been diagnosed with COVID-19. However, I'm not going to inform other teachers in the school or other parents in the school that don't, aren't at a need-to-know basis. The cohort of the infected individual will need to also be quarantined and move to remote learning. I will then distribute a cohort quarantine letter to all families and employees within that cohort. And when cohorts are quarantined, the entire cohort, student and staff, are sent home. They are asked to remain home until they have met the CDC's criteria to discontinue home isolation, which at this moment in time includes three days with no fever, or general symptoms improved, excuse me, three days with no fever and general symptoms have improved by at least 75% and 14 days since symptoms first appeared or 14 days since exposure to the infected individuals for asymptomatic individuals. Now again, we believe that this 14 days is, has been revised to 10 days, but as of this writing, that's why I'm saying the 14 days. I will work with the regional director, my supervisor, to decide if and when all or some of the cohort members can return to school. Students will be allowed to complete and submit whenever they're not at school, all work while quarantined. We will continue to closely monitor the health for all non-quarantined students in these cases. The clo if we need to quarantine a cohort, the classroom will be thoroughly cleaned up. Now, cleaning classrooms is going to happen uh, uh, on very regular intervals, and we do we will be cleaning these much more than ever before. But in the cases that a class or a cohort needed to be quarantined, um, they will be even more extensively cleaned, um, with windows in the area open to maximize airflow and so forth. In cases of widespread infection in a school, and particularly if this would happen to multiple cohorts, we might have to quarantine the entire school. And I will be working with my regional director to determine if, these, if this quarantine is needed. In cases where students, employees, or volunteers have exposed exposure to individuals, such as an immediate family member who are COVID-19 positive in their home, the following steps should be followed. The individual would be asked to remain at home for 14 days from the last exposure to their family member, or in the event of an employee, they, they continue in contact with their family member, excuse me, or in the event of the employee continues contact with their family member 14 days from the time when their family member has met the CDC's criteria to discontinue home isolation, which currently includes three days with no fever and other symptoms improved and 10 to 14 days since symptoms first appeared. Students will be allowed to complete and submit academic work again while at home. Just a note here, families that have multiple siblings in school, um, if one child or parent in the family is diagnosed with COVID-19, the entire family should remain at home until the conditions I just mentioned have been met. Again, there's a lot of scenarios here. What we're going to have also available to us is called a nurse hotline. So whenever any of these cases come to us uh, at administrative level in the school this year, I will always be referring to our nurses hotline and the archdiocese for guidance. And all decisions that we make will face, uh, that face a potential case of infection, I will be consulting with my supervisors. This again, this will be on our website, but there are so many unique scenarios and situations that I do feel that certainly at the beginning of the year I will be leaning, toward, and leaning on um, the, the expertise of through our nurse hotline and also the archdiocese. That's a lot to go through, and I do, uh, again, stress this information will be, will be on the website. Okay. Um, so since we kind of have the protocols laid out there, um, when, like, someone gets infected, um, I guess the next question would be, like, what would remote learning look like 
Um, is it going to be the same as last year? Is it going to be a little different, Mr. Shocker? The, yeah, the, the, I do believe our remote learning plan is much more extensive, comprehensive, and um, it, we're, we're prepared for this. We do have some students that have opted out of our in-person learning, so we're prepared for that with our remote learning um, plan. Now, remote learning, again, is going to look a little different for middle school students as it will for kindergarten students. It's going to look a little bit different if we had a class with 10 students that decided to remote learn as opposed to a class that had zero children who decided to opt into the remote learning uh, operation. But we are prepared. We also will be using a video, live feed video um, assistance while we're teaching this year. All our, all our staff, our K-5 staff will be asked for a minimal three touch points in the day um, with students that are at home in case they were quarantined. They, we, we're going to make sure that they have touched live using Zoom or Google Meet um, with us in the, in the actual classroom at least three touch points in a day, and this is for K-5 students. Um, and, and that's minimal. There might be more than that. In the middle school, it might look a little different. Um, but what we are going to utilize, which we did not utilize last year, is live streaming um, through the classroom um, perspective, and we'll be sending that home. Uh, we'll be able to access, uh, kids at home will be able to access that. Assessing and grading is back to normal. That was uh, put to the side last year. There were special um, sort of um, uh, ways that we were assessing student work. We're assessing student work whether you're at home or whether you're at school the same way we had before with the same grading procedures and uh, 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 attendance and assignments um, needing to be handed in using um, guide, uh, deadlines and such. So the attendance is going to be a little bit different than it was in the spring. The assessing and grading will kind of return back to where it was. Uh, teachers will have a little bit more consistent office hours for students that are at home or students that are quarantined. And the school will be running for students that are not here with the 8 o'clock and 2.45 time frame and we, as we didn't really have that um, last year. So th again, our remote learning will look a little bit different um, from an 8th grade perspective to a 1st grade perspective. But what we're really trying to emphasize this year is we want to be cognizant of keeping the student engaged in the day-to-day -day classroom and being part of the community. So we will be leaning on that, um, that live stream that we had not used last year. All right, good to know. Yeah, I think that's comforting to know what options we have available. Um, so shifting gears here, I think it's important to touch on um, how religion plays into um, our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so maybe this is a question for both uh, Mrs. Gray and Mr. Shocker. What is weekly mass going to look like? Um, can you maybe just kind of go into some detail about that? Okay, so um, there will still be weekly mass. It might be changing days of the week. It might move from Tuesday to Wednesday. Um, the thought is right now that Mass is being live streamed so it can be watched in the classroom. Uh, we are going to try to get uh, a group of students, say K to 2, 3 to 5, 6 to 8, into church, say every third week to um, be a live participant at Mass. And uh, we're talking with Father Chris about having a, a student-only mass with no um, outside parishioners attending so that we can keep our cohort models pretty closed. Um, so there's still discussions going on about that, but that's the plan going forward. Yeah, and I do believe that's where we're going to land. We're going to land on Wednesday uh, weekly mass, and as Mrs. Gray just explained, a third of the class a third of our school will come uh, attend church uh, every Wednesday um, on a rotating basis. And I just wanted to add that daily religion, uh, we go back to a day re daily religion program. Uh, religion for our remote learners and if we were had quarantine students in quarantine might look a little different as opposed to the daily um, religion um, classes, but uh, those details will, will come as we... Um, as we begin the school year about the religion piece. The other thing I just wanted to mention, our daily announcements and prayer will happen a little bit later in the day 
also. We, we just felt that, especially at the beginning of the year, so many new routines, we don't want to miss that daily prayer. Um, so we're going to have that a little bit later than it normally people, students um, are used to, so it won't be right at the beginning of the day. It'll be a little bit later than that. Okay, great. Um, obviously, we've been talking a lot about cleanliness, sanitation, um, those sorts of things to keep our community safe. But like, what are we doing as a school specifically to kind of make sure that the, that things are really clean? Um, and I guess this is a question directed at both of you guys. Um, Mr. Jerry Rivera, who's uh, head of our building and grounds here, um, has put together a schedule of cleaning. Um, our guys will be really cleaning almost like all day. If, if, we know a, if we know a group is going to be out of their room for a certain amount of time, this is going to be the time that somebody's going to come in and clean. I would say that rooms will probably be cleaned probably, uh, I'm thinking about three times within a 24-hour period after school, before school, and, and sometime during the day. The lunchrooms also will be uh, cleaned, deeply cleaned before and after we use those. And any common areas will definitely uh, uh, be a focus point here too. Open windows will be used, uh, fans, we've been told to reverse the rotation of the fan to uh, make sure that we're, our airflow is happening. Um, the filters in the air conditioning system over in Grace Hall have been uh, taken care of. Um, we are really focusing in on a very regimented, routine uh, cleaning uh, throughout the day. Uh, each classroom will have hand sanitizers. Um, we're, you're going to see some hand sanitizer, um, um, those uh, little hand sanitizer stations, stations yeah. around the building. So this has really been a priority of ours as, as we have spent the summer looking at this. Great. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, then, like, if students have common issues, like if they bump their head or if they scrape their knee, um, are they still going to the main office? Like, what's that going to look like? Yeah, and, and that we just want to stress. If somebody is showing, um, displaying COVID-19 type symptoms, they are going to a certain station and really go into isolation. For the student that scrapes their knee in the playground, for bumps their head, um, is just kind of generally not feeling too well, um, I would say if we don't feel those are COVID-19 symptoms, uh, we still will have a, a, a kind of a, the, what we've always been used to, um, the same protocol, come to the office and we'll take care of you up in front um, if Mrs. Hiddle's there or Mrs. Callahan is there, just as we always did. Great, yeah, it's, I think it's gonna be nice to have that nurse hotline available um, as well for just um, COVID stuff. Um, okay, and then in terms of uh, families you know, participating in our community like we usually do. Um, are we going to be allowing volunteers in the school, um, visitors, et cetera? Uh, volunteers and visitors will be strictly limited. Yeah, if, um, not, if not, not allowed at the beginning. If not, yeah, possibly not allowed at all. Um, there might be a few situations where we need to have volunteers for something and we'll seek those out. But for the most part, uh, parents are not allowed in the building. If you're, say, dropping off a lunch, Mrs. Hiddle is going to have a spot for you to just drop it inside of the door and not enter the building at all. Uh, we're going to try to do lunchroom without having um, parent volunteers. Um, Mr. Shocker and I are pretty much going to be in the lunchroom every day, every lunch period, and then with another teacher there. So um, we're gonna see how well that works to start off with. Okay, and then I would assume that parents, if they um, absolutely needed to come or we asked them to come um, to be a volunteer or whatever, um, they would be going through that, that, pro that process of getting their temperature checked and all that, right? Right, they will have okay. to have temperature checked and when they come in the building. Perfect, um, okay. Field trips, what are those gonna look like? Uh, there are, we, unfortunately, the, there's so many things this year that it almost, uh, I use these, I say things and I can't even believe I'm saying these. We're not going to have field trips this year, at least at the beginning. Um, there's just too much um, possibility of exposure um, and it just isn't safe at this time. So we're not going to be able to have field trips at the beginning of the year, uh, certainly. Um, but we, ho we hope that changes by at some time in the spring. 
Yeah, let's hope for the best, right? Um, okay. Emergency drills. Um, clearly, we, we don't have enough emergencies, right? Um, <laughs> what's, how is that going to look, Mrs. Gray, I, or anyone that wants to answer? Okay, so the emergency drills will happen at some point this fall. I mean, they're usually scheduled throughout the year. Um, they're going to utilize their outdoor exits as much as possible. And, um, right, we're just going to be doing the, the emergency drills. Yeah, I think that's just a normal happening. You know, when we're coming to school the first few weeks, we generally, uh, you know, students in schools, this is, this is part of the routine. That routine certainly will be there. We still have to follow through, make sure everybody understands what we would do in case of a fire, or in case of a, uh, you know, an intruder. These are drills that we will go through um, just as we always did. Okay, great. Um, and like, are teachers still going to have those special, like, instructional prep days? Um, yes, I, we want to add. Um, there are so many things, and I do greatly appreciate all of our community's um, understanding. And I think one of the themes of this year is just to be flexible. We are going to place a different. The original calendar that we had on our website is going to be amended. We need to put in some professional days for our teachers, um, and also we've put these professional days in the calendar um, to, to allow uh, some real deep cleaning on regular intervals to happen with no students in the building be, uh, be in the beginning of the year. So will there, there will be a revised calendar come out, coming out, and those, that revised calendar will reflect time for teachers, um, professional development for teachers, plus uh, to allow uh, deep cleaning in our building um, uh, without children and staff in. Okay. Um, I think it's also important to not only, well, to start talking about how we're going to monitor um, the safety of our school. So, um, like, how are we going to be assessing kind of our progress in terms of staying COVID free? One of the thoughts is, uh, and we do need to know, we need to know from parents, uh, as well as we know, we need to know internally how this is all working. And we, sir, I, I think what we will do is we'll set up some, whether it's a, 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 a unique email uh, address, some kind of a system that as we get started here, we can have some feedback from parents to, because uh, it's going to be important to get your feedback on how we're doing uh, and also internally feedback from staff. So we're going to be con continually monitoring how we're doing, certainly uh, at the beginning of the year. Yeah, and, and I think to piggyback off of that, um, I mean, we have this reopening committee that we've put together, and I think that that's something that we can always engage to really get a pulse of how everyone's feeling in the school community. Um, Mrs. Great, did you have anything to add? It looked like you wanted to say something. No, just that we've got to be flexible. As we go through these procedures and routines, we find that things are not working properly. We're going to change them to, um, to make them safer. Yeah. Great. So yeah, we're going to be, um, clearly we're going to be taking feedback. So um, definitely going to be as transparent as possible um, with our process. Um, now getting to my, more of my realm, the SEL world. Um, first off, again, um, as your school counselor, I'm going to do my absolute best to provide a safe environment for our kids and our staff. Um, so I... I'm confident that we're going to get through this as long as we follow these guidelines. Um, but I, on the first days of school, I will be going into each classroom, really making myself present, um, and really helping students process the expectations and some of the feelings that they're going through. So um, really going to be working a lot on self-regulation and coping skills with students, um, and just overall going to try to be as present as possible um, that much more this year. Um, in addition, this year I will be offering some journaling opportunities online for um, probably um, like third through eighth grade just to kind of help kids get their thoughts out um, online and maybe also to connect with other students just so they can see, you know, how other people are feeling about things and, and whatnot. So I really just want to create a dialogue about um, best practice and getting kids to express how they feel. Um, in addition, again, too, I will be 
um, and I've talked to Mr. Shocker about this um, a little bit, I will be sending out weekly mental health surveys to families that would like to opt into that kind of thing. So if um, you feel like your family would like to um, be checked in on, like by me, and um, just just to make sure that things are going okay, like I'm happy to do that. So um, please look out for an email from, from me um, towards the beginning of the year, probably in that first week, just to kind of see if you want to opt into that. Um, also, of course, please check my counseling page. Um, I'm, I'm sure some of you have checked it out. Um, also, the, the school newsletter, there will be updates um, about SEL, um, updates regarding you know the, the latest trends and whatnot. Um, also, I, I believe we're using the, the e-learning website that we had last year again, so I will be posting um, you know, SEL tools, activities, and just, again, current articles. So be on the lookout for, for those things. Um, I know I just threw a lot at you, but if you have any questions, please reach out to me um, or Mr. Shocker or Mrs. Great. Um, I'm happy to field your questions and want to make this a safe, a safe space and um, uh, an enjoyable year for all of us. Um, that being said, uh, we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about back to school night. So maybe we can talk a little bit about what that's going to look like. Okay, and I think I'm going to kind of wrap it up here. Okay, I mean, Unless Perfect. you guys want to add yeah. something. Uh, so back to school night right now uh, is on our calendar for September 10th. Um, it will be done uh, remotely. Uh, matter of fact, it might be done right here in the church uh, or from the church, our back to school night. Um, we just, we're not going to be able to bring everybody together, unfortunately. So that will be done remotely. Uh, more information to come, but that is, um, we do know that we're not going to be able to have that live. But it will, it will uh, happen on the 10th um, as it was scheduled. Okay, we, we just threw a lot at you, and as I, st as I stated at the beginning, there's no way we have answered everybody's questions. Um, Please call me um, if, if you have any further concerns. Uh, call Mrs. Great, call Mr. Uh, Johnson, as, we, as we've just said. Um, I, I first of all want to thank um, Beverly and Kirk for taking the time out to put this video together. Uh, behind the scenes, um, if it weren't for Michael Ward and Michael Daly, we could not do what we're doing right now. A great big thanks to them. I also want to thank our reopening committee. Um, there's a slide with everybody's name on that. We had parents, um, teachers, um, staff members on that, and they were just a wonderful help as we put that together. We are going through, and as I keep saying, unprecedented times, we're going through these times together um, with our faith and with our belief in God watching over us always. I am very confident that we're going to do well. Um, I, I've told people, many people that I've spoken with, we're a small school, we've got a really nice facility. If it's going to happen successfully, we're going to be able to do it, but it's going to take all of us, and it's going to take all of us to follow the guidelines that we went through today. Um, so with that, uh, thank you for tuning in, um, and I can't wait to see everybody, and I know I'm speaking for both of you guys, I can't wait to see everybody on our first day of school. Thanks again.